Okay, so this is 4.1, which is extreme values of functions, so maximums and minimums. So first, think about what would be required for a function to be guaranteed to have a maximum and a minimum value on an interval. For those of you that took AB, you may hear the words maximum and minimum and immediately think about derivatives. This has nothing to do with derivatives. We are going to talk a little bit about how derivatives come into play, but whether a function has a maximum or minimum is not going to be determined by the derivatives. So in order for a function to have a maximum and minimum, to be guaranteed to have both on a closed interval, it doesn't need to be a closed interval, and it needs to be a continuous function. That's it. If those two things are true, then you are guaranteed to have at least a maximum and a minimum. It may occur at multiple places, um, but you're guaranteed to have both a maximum and a minimum. So here is a picture example of what that looks like. This one, you have a continuous function on a closed interval. So the minimum would be happening right here and the maximum would be at an endpoint. If you have a continuous function that's not a closed interval, we're not including this endpoint. So this would not be considered a maximum because it's not included in the interval we're looking at. This one would be the minimum though. For this one, you have a closed interval, but it's not a continuous function. So right here, there's an open circle. It's filled in right here, but that means the function is not continuous because the limit would not be the same as the value of the function. So here, this point right here, because it's not included, this would not be considered a minimum. This one would be the maximum. So in order to be guaranteed to have both, you have to have a continuous function on a closed interval. That is what the extreme value theorem says. If you have a continuous function on a closed interval, then the function has both a maximum and a minimum value on that interval. So um, if it doesn't say whether it's a local or, or a relative maximum or minimum, and we'll talk about what that means in a little bit, then it is implied that that would be the absolute maximum and minimum. So extreme value theorem is going to be the absolute highest that a function gets and the absolute lowest that a function gets. So here are some examples. These are all continuous functions on closed intervals. So these would be four different examples of where the extrema could occur. So for this one, they're both going to be on the interior. So the maximum would be right here, the minimum would be right here. So it doesn't happen at the endpoints, but we do need to include the endpoints in the interval because it could be happening at the endpoints. For this one, they are both going to be at the endpoints. This would be the maximum, this would be the minimum. For this one, maximum is going to be in the interior, that's right here. Minimum is going to be at the end, the end point, which is right here. And then for this last one, minimum is going to be on the interior, minimum would be right here. Maximum would be at an endpoint, so maximum would be right here. So the other thing to point out is that when it says maximum or minimum, we're talking about the y value. So you have to make sure that you are reading the questions carefully. If they are asking you for the maximum or minimum value, that means the y value. If they're asking where does it occur, that would be the x values. So definition of local extrema. So first of all, another name for local. So you may have seen this before. This would be relative. So relative or local maximum or minimum. So if you look here, this function, we're only looking at part of it, but because this is x cubed, uh, it would be going on forever over here and for forever over here. So technically there wouldn't be a maximum or minimum because you have the function going on forever in both directions. But these points right here are local maximums or minimums. Think, so think about how you might define that. I'm gonna go over the formal definition of local extrema. So, the, these are going to be the, the definition of local. This is going to be the def definition of absolute maximum um, and minimum. So a relative or a local maximum value happens when you have a, the, that value is going to be bigger or greater than every other function value in some open interval. So that means in some smaller interval, it's going to be the absolute maximum. So there's no larger value nearby. So that's what this picture is showing down here and I'll explain this picture in a minute. 
and then local minimum would be other way around. So it's going to be the value that is smaller or greater than, or smaller or equal to every other value in some open interval. The absolute maximum is the largest value in the entire interval. And then the absolute minimum is the smallest value in the entire interval. So down here, absolute minimum, there's no smaller value of the function anywhere in the interval that we're looking at. A, an absolute minimum is also considered a local. So it's both. It's kind of like how a square is a rectangle, but a rectangle is not a square. So um, local, so absolute maximums and minimums are also local, but not the other way around. This one would be a local maximum because there's no greater y value nearby. There is going to be greater y values if I go far away, but if I look close around in an open interval, close around that point, it's the largest. This is a local minimum because there's no smaller values nearby. This is an absolute maximum because it is the largest on the entire interval that we're looking at. And this one is a local minimum, so there's no smaller values nearby. So critical points. Those of you who took AB may hear the word maximum or minimum and immediately think about critical points. So a critical point is when the derivative is equal to zero or does not exist. This doesn't mean it's automatically going to be a maximum or minimum. It is a potential maximum or minimum, but we don't know for sure if it's going to be. And we're gonna look at specifically how you would tell that it's a maximum or minimum in a different section. But for now, we are going to be looking at critical points. So local extreme values, if a function has a local maximum or minimum, so we already know it has a maximum or minimum, then that means if the first derivative exists, then it has to be zero. So basically, if we already know that something is a maximum or minimum on the interior, then I know those have to be critical points, but not every critical point is going to give us a maximum or minimum. So if you think about this right here, we already know these are maximums and minimums. So that means that if the derivative exists, which we can tell by the picture, then the derivative is going to be zero here. This one, the derivative doesn't exist. So this one is asking how many critical points does this function have? So what you would have to do is take the derivative and set it equal to zero. If it's asking for maximums and minimums, you, there's something else you have to do, but critical points, you are just taking the first derivative and setting it equal to zero. So for this one, you could distribute everything out. I think that's gonna take a little bit longer. So you're gonna have to do um, product rule. So x minus two squared derivative of this one is gonna be four times x plus three cubed. And then x plus three to the fourth. And this one is gonna be two times x minus two to the first. And you are going to have to, we're going to set that equal to zero. You are going to have to do a little bit of simplifying. So I can factor out an x minus two from both of these pieces, and I can factor out an x plus three cubed. So I'm going to do that up here. x minus, we're going to also actually factor out a two from both terms. So x minus two and x plus three cubed. And then what I'm left with is gonna be x minus two times two, because I factored out a two, and there's a four right here, plus x plus three. And I set that entire thing equal to zero. So we're not actually solving for the critical points, we're just figuring out how many there are. So here I can see um, that if I set this entire thing equal to zero, I would set this equal to zero. That would give me one critical point. I set this equal to zero. That's going to give me another critical point. And then I simplify all of this and solve it. And this part is going to give me another critical point. So I know that there are going to be three total. If you're having trouble with that, you could actually solve for all of them, but you don't need to. 
So this one is really the most common types of question that you type, type of question that you see with extreme, um, with absolute maximums and minimums. It's going to be different when you have relative maximums and minimums. So again, those of you that took AB see maximum and minimum and probably immediately want to find the critical points and then you're done. You don't need to do that when you have a um, closed interval. So you do need to find the critical points, but you don't need to make a sign chart, which some of you may be thinking about that. That's going to be in 4.2. So the first thing I'm going to do is find the critical point. So I take the derivative. So I bring the two thirds down. That's going to be, make the coefficient of two X to the negative one third. Now, normally what you do is when you're finding critical points, the most common thing to do is to set the derivative equal to zero. In this case, it's never going to be zero, but a critical point could be happening at um, when the derivative doesn't exist. So for this one, the derivative does not exist at x equals zero. So zero is going to be the critical point. So you don't need to make a sign chart. We don't need to find when the derivative changes sign and all of that. That's going to be for relative and we'll do that in a different section. When you need to find absolute maximums and minimums on a closed interval, it's easier. You need to find the critical points. And then what you need to do is you need to find the Y value at the endpoints and at your critical points. So I plug these values back into the original function to find the y value on the original curve. So if I plug negative one in, I get three. If I plug zero in, I get zero. If I plug two in, I get three times three times um, four to the two thirds or cube root of four, if you simplify or sorry, it'd be two to the two thirds, so cube root of four. So we don't know exactly what this value is. I mean, that's gonna be some decimal. You can plug it into your calculator to see what it's going to be, but I do know that it's going to be bigger than three because I have three times something that I know is greater than one. So this is going to be the maximum. And this one is the smallest. So I know this one is the minimum. That is all of the justification you need. That's all of the work that you need to show for something like this. It is going to be different if you are justifying relative maximums and minimums, but for absolute maximums on a closed interval, this is the process you're doing. And then this is the process in words, what you're doing. So anytime you are being asked for maximums and minimums on a closed interval, first you're gonna find the critical point, so where the derivative doesn't exist or is equal to zero. You're going to find the, the value or the y value of the function at each critical point at the endpoints, and that's it. So the maximum is going to be the largest y value. The minimum is the smallest y value. You do not need to write a sentence justification for this. It will be different for relative, but for absolute, this is the process you're going through. Okay, and then this one, it is asking you for the absolute maximum of the function on the closed interval. So same thing that we did before. So the first derivative is going to be 4 minus 2x, and I set that equal to 0. So you're going to get x <coughs> equals 2. And then I need to find f of zero, f of two, and f of four. And if you find all of those, the largest of the three is going to be your maximum. And if you do that, you should be getting that the largest value is 10. So don't forget to also check um, endpoints. So that's gonna be the most common mistake is most people just take the critical point, plug that in, um, and then use that as the maximum, but it's possible that your maximum or minimum is going to be at the end point, so don't forget to check those.